Are you green screening? Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the presentation of our Zoom cast called The Circle. We're glad you joined us this morning for a topic that was close to our heart and certainly something that I've worked with for many years, the language of leadership and building culture of trust in your Catholic school. I'm Bernard Dumont with the consulting group Catholic Vitality 360, and we partner with Catholic parishes and schools and dioceses on building Catholic communities of faith and thriving communities of faith. We'd like to jump in this morning with um, our topic on the language of leadership, and we always begin with an opening prayer. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us recall that we are in God's presence. Almighty God, come to my assistance, and Lord, make haste to help me. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning with our concerns, our hopes, and dreams, and we pray for the virtues of patience and persistence. The virtue of patience as we are patient with others, patient with our students, patient with ourselves, and patient with all those within our care. We also ask you for the virtue of persistence as we move through the final stages of the school year, and we finish strong, and we touch people's hearts, and we become an inspiration for those who we serve. For this we pray, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Once again, thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, this is our third broadcast of the Zoom cast we're calling this, called the Vitality Collective. And this is a place to learn, a place to share, a place to grow, a place to collaborate and discover. At Catholic Vitality 360, we're here to serve and we form partnerships and we'd like to be of service to you and whatever you'd like to share with us. Today's topic, of course, is leadership. And so let's jump right in. I love the topic here of leadership and also of this quote. Whether you're a school leader or a parish leader, or a leader of any organization, the culture in your school or parish is shaped by the worst behavior of the leader that the leader is willing to tolerate. Very interesting quote as we begin the discussion on leadership. And we often find that those within our leadership charge are wondering and, and seeking out what is the behavior that will be tolerated. And often they move to that level of behavior. And I was in a school this week in a, 
in the Diocese of Lake Charles. And within about 10 minutes, I could tell that this was a place of leadership, high standards, and respect. And interesting quote as we consider this topic. I've often shared this too in the, in the realm of leadership, that this is an important concept to understand. And the concept to understand here is that Whatever is happening in your school, which is the E here for the event, whatever is happening academically or enrollment-wise, marketing with parents or students or faculty and staff, you know, this time of the year is very heavily devoted to enrollment and to marketing and to academics for the final, you know, nine weeks of the year. And so events are happening around school and activities. And as leaders, it's our job to understand those activities and events and then formalize a response or put together a response. And that response, based on the events that are happening, will determine the outcomes. If we want higher enrollment or solidified enrollment, we must market the school to tell our story. And so if there's something happening in your school and in your parish, the response will make all the difference. So it's not what happens. More importantly, it's what you do to what's happening. And are you ready to respond? And we often say in our work that in this particular case, the response is based on finding the truth, no blaming, no complaining, find the best options, build the mission, promoting vitality, and let's get to work. So this is very important as a leadership concept to understand that we must create responses that produce the desired outcomes. The response we talk about a lot here at Catholic Vitality 360 is of course, vitality, right? Catholic school, Catholic parish, diocesan vitality. And we talk about this a lot in the sense of measuring vitality and also creating a culture of vitality. And I'll show you in a minute that we have these seven circles of Catholic vitality. There are seven circles for schools, there are seven circles for parishes, and there are seven circles for dioceses. And we've created these seven components that are measurable and also allow you to grow and prosper and be sustainable. And I'll share that with you as we move ahead. The goal is to build a culture of vitality, to build a culture of vitality. It doesn't arrive instantly, it must be built. And there's some components here that you can see that we certainly measure. Uh, one of the things that we need to be aware of is negativity, right? And I'll show you in a minute that there are non-negotiables as leaders, right? As leaders, and I talked about this on my visit with our school on Tuesday, is that we have a policy in the building of no complaining. We have a policy in the building of no gossip. And so no negativity, and that negates vitality, right? So we must create this culture of positive solutions. I have a principal that tells me uh, that his culture is to his teachers, he says, a principal, he says, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. And so that's the key. We all are facing challenges. The key is solutions, right? School vision, empowering others, and I'll share with you the seven circles of vitality. Interesting concept here. As building, as we build a culture of vitality, that we can measure it. And your school vitality is in direct proportion to the quality of your relationships, the quality of your vision, and the quality of the processes you have in place. I hear quite often that we need to grow our enrollment or hire new teachers or build a better curriculum. And my question is always, what's the process? What relationships do you have? What is your vision around these challenges? And so we create the mindset of vitality, we create strategies to address that, and then we begin the process of executing. 
We see here again, as we've talked about, the seven circles of Catholic vitality. And if you go to our website, you can find a copy of this, and you can actually fill it out electronically, and it will give you a live score instantly based on your results. We have faculty and staff that are jumping online to fill it out, and then you can make a copy of the results. And so the first thing to understand is that the seven circles of Catholic vitality is a framework for success. These are measurables. These are to be identified within the building. And there is a culture built around each of the seven circles in terms of executing strategies. On the flip side of this graphic is the scorecard. And this is what a number of schools are completing right now. And I pass this out and I give it to groups and faculty and staff members, and they begin to fill it out. I ask them to fill it out three times a year in September, in January, and in June. And certainly what we want through this exercise three times a year is for the scores to do what? To go up, right? And so for each of the different components, there are five elements of measurement. And those can be scored one to four based on your opinion or your perspective. Of course, a one is not evident, a two is emerging, a three is operational, and four, that item is highly functional. And then you can get your total score. And the goal is to bring it to your team, to bring it to your perhaps grade level teachers and have a conversation. How do we score visionary leadership? How do we score our Catholic values? How do we score academics and communication and enrollment and student life and funding, right? How do we score these seven areas? And where are some areas of growth? The most important thing here is that there's an agreement. We reach consensus on the score and that we agree that these are the three to four areas that we must address. If you want to address one area, I call that the hole in the boat theory, right? The hole in the boat. There's a, there's a hole in your boat. We're all in the same boat here, metaphorically. But water's coming in. Let's say it's enrollment or funding. And let's get down to the business of solving that. And that would be the seven circles. As we talk about the language of leadership, there are some things I want you to be aware of. And as we build culture and engagement, we have to be aware of these destructive responses. Have any of you heard these in any particular case as you present something? And these are, we've always done it this way. Oh, we can't afford that. Oh, we just don't have the resources. Or that's not us. Or not my job, right? This needs to be flipped, right? This is a negative response, right? We want to turn that into a positive culture. And so we're going to talk about how we do that in just a moment. I also talked about earlier these non-negotiables as leaders, and these are presented as a leadership team. And this is setting the behavior and the expectations in the building. And so these are the five non-negotiables. And in some schools, these are signed and in contracts. And so there's some seriousness around these five non-negotiables. First non-negotiable is no complaining, right? No complaining, it's negative energy and it brings us down. The second non-negotiable is no gossip. We're not interested in this, not positive. We're not talking about each other. We're not talking about what their friends did or their girlfriend or boy, no gossip in the building, right? We want to focus on positive conversations. The third non-negotiable is we all respect each other, right? The fourth non-negotiable, we don't talk about problems. We provide solutions. In fact, I stay away from the word problems. I'm going to give you a word for that. And the word is challenges, right? Challenges is a positive response. Yes, we have three identified challenges from our scorecard assessment. And here's our plan. We have solutions. We have a plan. We have a team. It's all about responding, right? Remember the E plus R equals O? The R is in the middle, and that is our response. 
We have a funding issue. We have an enrollment issue. We have an academic issue. We have a faculty issue. Our response makes all the difference and that will determine the outcomes. Non-negotiable number five, we work together as a team. There is wonderful knowledge and power and strength in this team you have. The school I was with on Tuesday, they have 42 faculty members. So much knowledge, so much enthusiasm, so much work that they've done and experience that they have to solve many of the challenges. Now, we like to focus on three challenges at a time. The number three is doable, not 33. And so coming out of the assessment tool, the scorecard, uh, three of, I call them the big three, right? The big three challenges. And we get down to the business of solving them. We also must create culture before strategy, right? So many times by way of example, I've been invited to work with a school to partner with the school on a strategic vision, right? And so over the course of uh, several months, four or five months, we create all these strategies. We break teams up into groups and we identify the challenges and we come up with a list of solutions. People feel good about it, but ultimately it comes down to, do we have the right people, the right culture, the right processes in place to address these strategies? Sometimes we don't. So I often say that strategy is ineffective without the proper culture. We have to understand the who, promote the why, engage our faculty, be strategic, give them credit, and then celebrate. But culture is so much more important before strategy. I often find that if there's a lot of strategy and it's not getting accomplished, then something's not working on the policy or procedure or the leadership side. All these strategies are presented, but something is a barrier. Let's identify those cultural barriers. The culture should be open to change and ready to get to work. We also talk about these covenants, right? I call this the leadership covenant, right? These are agreements that leaders must understand. Every good leader that I've ever worked with has these somewhere in their mindset and in their processes. And so I call this the leadership covenant, the agreements that leaders make in terms of Catholic parishes and Catholic schools. And here they are. The first agreement to make really with yourself is a desire for ongoing spiritual growth that as a good Catholic man or woman, that you are growing in your faith. And so there's spiritual growth. The second agreement is that you are willing to listen. And you're not talking over people. You're not uh, just rushing through, but you are listening to them. Good leaders also agree that they're open to further study and professional development, that I will commit to ongoing professional development, or surrounding myself with people that have knowledge that I may not have, or can execute strategies that I may not be able to execute. The next one here is that there's an eagerness to cast out within the school a vision for the future, to create it, to communicate it, to commit to it, right? And there's an eagerness to cast that out and support that. Good leaders also make an agreement to animate the gifts in other people. That's what I mentioned at this school that I visited on Tuesday, that there are 42 special people in the building with gifts and talents and experience and knowledge. We often sometimes think, well, we're alone in this, or who else has done this, or I'm not sure where to start. Even in your parent base or your parishioner base, there is great talent. And you can tap into that, but the ability to animate gifts of other people. Also an agreement to delegate, that we cannot take everything on, that things will require teamwork and expertise, and that we're willing to delegate duties to other people, a very important agreement uh, for leaders to make. We also must, as a leader, make decisions. Hopefully they're good decisions. You pray about them, think about them, get some counsel from other folks, but that we're in the business of making decisions. It may not be always the best decision 
or even just perfection. We're not going for perfection, but we have to make the best decision we can. We also must be excited as a leader about the mission of the school. People are looking to us to cast that vision, to get excited, to be part of that future, you know, the vision for the future and a long-term vision that can engage others in that vision. And then finally, the agreement is to share the credit. Share the credit of any success that happens in your building. Because as principal or other leaders, you're going to get credit. But it's important to share credit with all those that had anything to do with this success. Small successes. I mean, just the, you know, I call this the, the good news network in a school. Find those things that are good news items and share those in announcements, in newsletters, in discussions, in faculty meetings, with the parents, with the alumni, on your website, all social media. You're finding good news and you're sharing credit. Very important to agree as leaders to these. Well, let's talk about the language of leadership. And we talked about culture. We've talked about some of the agreements. We talked about some non-negotiables. We talked about the language of a challenge and solutions. Let's talk about some words that matter. And it really is turning potentially some of that negativity into something very positive. We like to utilize phrases here. So when we introduce something to our community, to our parents or faculty and staff, we hear something like this. We've never done it before, right? Well, that's not a reason not to do it. Let's turn that into this is a wonderful opportunity for us to move forward, to create a new program, to get new people involved. I was having a conversation recently about the uh, engagement of alumni on the Catholic elementary school level. And there were three people in the room and two of them said, well, we've never been able to invite or engage our alumni at this elementary school because they're involved in their Catholic high school or their uh, college. And I said, well, that's an interesting point. I said, how much have you worked to engage them? Because there's fond memories if people were here from pre-K to their eighth grade year, that's 10 years of their life that they spent at your school. And there's great memories through their younger years, through their middle school years. Those are wonderful ministries. And so we turn the conversation around to let's engage them because they spent 10 years here and there's great memories. So it's a wonderful opportunity. On the negative side, it may be it will never work. And we turn that around and we say, let's give it a try. Everything that you're doing now was new at one time. It's even new to the people at your school, right? So we can't certainly say that will never work. Well, let's give it a try. Everything started somewhere. Everything was a let's give it a try. Let's begin. Okay. And so let's think about that. How about we've already tried it. And maybe there was a, a negative response. And that may become, we've learned from that experience. So we tried it. Perhaps it didn't go as well as we thought, but we learned from it and we're building on that. How about we don't have the expertise? Well, I just talked about the, the incredible amount of expertise we have in our faculty and staff and within our parent group and alumni group if we invite. I had a school that I worked with a number of years ago that wanted to write a marketing plan. And uh, we assembled the advisory council. And the idea came up that we have a parent who has three children at the school that runs a marketing firm. And this is her profession. She's an expert in marketing and social media. All we had to do was invite her <laughs> to the meeting, lay out the plan, and she was off and running. And that made all the difference. We identified her as an expert. We found her to, to share services and give us free services. And there was an agreement that she would help us with the marketing plan and, and execute that. And it made all the difference in terms of the success. So we have expertise. So instead of we don't have the expertise, Let's network with those that have it. How about this language? We don't have enough money. Well, that's not a reason. 
Okay. And I've always said that if it's important to you and it's a priority, we will find it. There are so many things that we can discuss as part of a vision that needs funding. Let's say we need new textbooks or we need to build a new building or renovate the campus or hire a special ed teacher or th th that is available to us without the barrier of finances. So we say to that, we are a good, a good investment to make. I have a school that I'm working with in Michigan where they're visiting 100 people in 100 days. The president, the principal, the development director are out visiting 100 people in 100 days and they're sharing the vision. And what they have found is when they share the vision, people want to be engaged in that. And some have become donors because of that visit. That wasn't their original intent. The intent was to, to visit them and, and uh, engage them in a relationship, further the relationship, cultivate that. But they also are talking about the needs of the school. And ultimately, we've had some families donate to specific projects. So money is not the barrier. How about this? We're just too busy. I hear that also. We need to turn that and say, we need to make this a top priority. Okay. Busy is not the reason. We sometimes need to determine that busy is not effective. Sometimes busy is not effective. Just the, the act of movement <laughs> is not effective. And so we work with our leadership teams to create three priorities. And those are the three priorities this year. And we focus our energy and our expertise and our talent on those three. And then finally, the worst of all, we can't. We just can't do it. <laughs> and then we turn that around and we say, we can. And let's give it a try. So in terms of language, leaders need to have this language of success, this language of vitality. And these are the words that certainly do matter. We talked about challenges earlier. And the way we respond to the challenge, much like the events and the response and the outcome, is very important. Let's say right now your challenge is enrollment for next year. A lot of schools in April, you know, January, this is the season for marketing and enrollment for next year. And we're certainly uh, graduating a group of students. We need to replace those students. And perhaps you have a goal beyond that number that you need to bring into the building for budgeting purposes, for hiring purposes, and just uh, for tuition and, and funding. And so enrollment is not a problem. It's a challenge and it's an opportunity to reach out. And certainly there's a number of uh, strategies we can share with you around enrollment. But instead of thinking of them as problems or negatives, we see challenges then as opportunities. Another piece that I've shared with teams in terms of making decisions is what you see here called the strategic thinking model. If there's ever a, a, a strategy or a process or something we're thinking about, this is the template to start asking some very important questions. It may be academics, it may be staffing, it may be facilities, it may be in student life or ministry or, or in, in our religion classes, but this is the template that I work with schools on when there's a new process being suggested. And so we ask some questions, okay? The most important question is you're proposing this activity and how does this activity advance our mission and vision? It must be within the furthering of our mission to make saints of these students, to make them critical thinkers, to send them off into the world with these gifts and talents, but certainly to get them to heaven, right? And so that's the first question. Who will be impacted? How will they be impacted? What are the outcomes, required resources, value proposition, measurement, all of these are important as we look at different processes. And then there's a series here, which I will not read in detail in the interest of time, but there's a series here on effective leadership and practices. And some of them are, are here for your edification. So first to acquire knowledge and information, to convert that knowledge and information into action, to take responsibility for communication. And you can see 
uh, the, the pieces here in terms of the marketing piece and advantages, promoting that and engagement. And then accountability is important as a leader, right? To, to have accountability across the school. We have other issues related to being a school of vitality. And there's a system here that if you'd like more information, I can share with you. But we've created what's called the V7 leadership system around the seven circles. And I did a workshop last uh, school year, this school year in the fall and the spring for a group of schools in the Diocese of Lake Charles, Louisiana. And they've adopted this model to take the seven circles and build a leadership team around the seven circles of vitality. And members of that team are responsible for one or more of the seven circles. So when activities come up or strategies are proposed, then members of the team are responsible for that particular circle of the seven circles. And they're putting the system in place right now. The system, to think as a system, is very important. So here are some other words that we talk about in terms of leadership, right? Just some words to have as part of your conversations. We use the words, our vision. We use collaboration. We use together. We use the word vitality. We use faith community and team and partnership. The word partnership is so important. We're in partnership with the Catholic Church. We're in partnership with our parents. We're in partnership with our students. We're in partnership with our alumni and friends. We're in partnership with grandparents and all those that have a relationship with us. Partnership. We also say things like, we're going to make it happen. We say, let's explore our options. We say, let's think this through, right? When, when, when an issue comes up that we need to talk about, let's think this through. I've also heard in meetings where we need to get some ideas and get some input, we say, I'd like to make a suggestion. Not just rushing into an idea, but let's think about this, and I'd like to make a suggestion. Also, one of my favorites is, what are our best solutions? Opening people up to possibilities. This is the language of leadership, vision, collaboration, vitality, togetherness, teamwork, partnership. We're going to think this through. Let's look at options, okay? This is the language that people respond to. So I want to share that with you. And also how we build trust. Good leaders are always building trust. And without trust, it really falls apart. So along the lines of visionary leadership, which is our first of the seven circles of Catholic School Vitality, visionary leadership, that visionary leaders are building trust. Visionary meaning that they're not living just for today, but they have a vision for the future. You're, you, you have a plan for today. You have a plan for tomorrow, you have a plan for next week, next month, and also next year. You're a visionary leader. It's not just, oh God, how can I get through the next day? But I'd like to have uh, those of us involved in a much larger vision. And so let's talk about building trust in your school community. The first way to build trust is to understand and promote a clear mission and to talk about mission. Our mission is clear. It is to get these students to heaven, to build saints, to build academic leaders, academic excellence, critical thinkers, to, to function well in the world, right? And so heaven, academics, critical thinking, that's our mission. The second is to display on a regular basis competency, that you're a competent leader. You also are trustworthy. You're worthy of trust. And so in the case of being a visionary leader, that you exhibit trust and you're trustworthy. You say what you're going to do and you do what you say. We also need to invest in people. And sometimes it's hard to delegate because we sometimes want to control the outcomes. But my experience has been that with these talented people, it can be so much better. 
right? Not a large group, but surround yourself with a group of five, 10 or so people and build and invest in those people. And that will make all the difference. To be transparent, the why of a decision, the how of a decision, the policy of a decision, the, the canon law of a decision, why we're bound by this policy and procedure and what it's about. Great leaders communicate and are transparent about every decision. We don't hide decisions. We don't run from decisions. We, we communicate those. Sometimes it's difficult. Don't run from the difficulties and being transparent. To walk the walk. If we're going to be a visionary leader, we've got to do the work. And so to be that person, to say what you're going to do and then do what you say and to lead with integrity. I often find that a classroom is sort of a microcosm of the whole school. And uh, even young students can, can evaluate their teacher <laughs> in a very short amount of time. And so uh, they're watching everything and they're watching decisions and they're watching what you're doing and they're watching how things are done, how you dress and all of these little indicators of leadership, the words you use, how you treat others, how we respect the rules, how we follow the rules, how we're transparent, how we communicate the words that we share, how we interact with students. And so leading with that integrity and important how your faith is, is paramount in your life. And Christ is the center of your leadership. The, le the, the example of Jesus Christ as a leader is your model of leadership. And think about how Jesus was a leader to others and his disciples and others while he was on earth. And so there's a, that's a trustworthy uh, process. Another piece that I use, and this is in the, uh, in the slides, and also I can send this to you, is a form of evaluation that I've used uh, to determine how you're doing. And in any particular case, whether that's leadership or enrollment or uh, visioning or any particular case, um, I ask about these three components. This is called a discovery exercise to discover an outcome or discover a path forward. And the first component here to the right is what in this particular case must we do more of? More of what in this particular case? The second discussion item is what must we do less of in this case? And then finally, in those particular instances, what must we do differently to achieve a different outcome? And so I would walk, work with you on this as a leadership team, whether it's a, a, a particular process or something you're planning to do or a strategic vision of some kind. And this is a uh, exercise we would go through. I also want to share with you why people give. And, and this is an important component to uh, getting people involved in our building. And giving comes in all different forms. Giving can be uh, of their time, of their treasure, of their wisdom. Uh, people give many different aspects of their lives. Time, talent, wisdom, and treasure are basically the four components of giving. And let's take a look at these in terms of a quick measurement of are these in place in your school? Is there a belief in the mission? Is there a compelling case? Is there personal invitation? Is there good communication? Is it easy to give? Do we recognize our volunteers? Is there a strong vision of vitality? And are we good stewards of those gifts that people give us as leaders? And so these are important to understand why people give, but the opposite of these are also reasons why people do not give. And so think about that as we invite people to be a part of our school. And then I'll close our discussion at this point as we get into your thoughts or your ideas as part of our discussion today. I'll, I'll share with you three key strategies that, that pulls all this together. The first leadership strategy, which may be as of a surprise to you, is that we need to be very protective of our time. And I have coached principals and others to have a no open door policy. And let me explain this. I've been in meetings with principals in their office and the door is open and they're constantly being interrupted. And so this idea that 
the door is always open and I will receive anyone at any time is really disruptive. And so what we what we do here is that we we certainly want to invite people to come and visit with us and have meetings, but the door is not always open because you're working and you're having other meetings and you're working on other items on your list of, of action items. And so to say that, I'd love to meet with you, but please schedule a time to meet with me. And if my door is closed, that means I'm working and that I'm either working on my action items or I'm with someone else. The second strategy is that schedule your time during the day for emails and phone calls. That the email list that's piling up in your inbox is not going to be dealt with all day long. There's maybe two or three blocks of time that you're in the office trying to address email traffic and also make phone calls. The door is closed and you're working on these items. 20 minutes on emails and 10 or 15 minutes on phone calls, depending on the day, and that's scheduled within your day. The third strategy that I've used very effectively in my work is a process called time boxing. And time boxing is a strategy that says, we have a list of action items for the week or for the day. And time boxing says we actually schedule those activities within boxes of time or blocks of time in the day. And so from 9 to 10, you're going to make these calls. From 9.30 to 10.30, you're going to check email. From 11 o'clock to 11.30, I have a meeting with our athletic director. From 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, we're talking about advancement and enrollment, and that's a meeting. And so even if it's a to-do list item or an action item that you schedule these items, you box them out, right? You box them out in your schedule and that's called time boxing. So you take the list of action items and you certainly simply schedule those. You simply schedule those in your calendar and that is a prominent feature of your day. You may have some time for meetings. You may have some time for uh, other reflection or prayer time or mass time or other action items, but time boxing schedules your activities. Okay. So let's move the portion of our Zoom cast here, the circle, to any particular share time. And so we've had some teaching today on the language of leadership and how to build trust in your school. And for the remaining time together, uh, we're open to questions, we're open to uh, experiences, uh, any successes you've had, any best practices that you're following as a leader, any wisdom you'd like to share, or any insights. If you want to release your mute button and you want us to all hear you, you can certainly do that. But we're open to any questions, uh, anything that you've had as a success, any best practices, any wisdom you'd like to share, or any insights. Okay, so I have some uh, in the chat box and in some uh, questions, uh, there were some things that people have shared with me and I'll share those with you. Uh, some of them may be on today or they may have sent this to me through the chat. One of the questions that I got in the, in the chat box was, uh, we love the suggestions on language, but how do we deal with difficult people? And so, great question. How do we deal in our school community with difficult people? Sometimes they're just uh, difficult people to deal with. Sometimes they're going through something or they're not having a good day or something's not uh, going well in their life or going well in the day. But how do you deal with difficult people, either as a staff member or as a parent or some other uh, person. And so I would say uh, a couple of things here in terms of dealing with difficult people. Uh, the first thing is I would find the truth of what they're saying or what they're upset about, right? Sit down with them. And this is an eyeball to eyeball meeting or maybe a phone call. But the first thing to do is to find common ground around the truth. Tell me what concerns you. Tell me what you're concerned about. Uh, find the truth of what they're asking or are upset about. So number one would be to find the truth. 
The second thing is to respond in a positive way. It may be a policy or a procedure or something they're not aware of. And so tell them the why of that. So first is find the truth. The second strategy is to tell them why. And often those are policies and procedures perhaps out of your control or out of something, uh, out of the realm of a school community. It may be a uh, something within the Catholic church or something within canon law or something within a, a legal realm that uh, simply we're following that policy and procedure, but tell them the why. The third thing I would do is simply listen. You know, a lot of people I've found, if they're bringing something to us and they're upset, they just want to be listened to. Uh, they haven't been heard or want to be heard. Uh, and I have also found that they're, they're, they're not looking all the time to cause problems or to get you to solve this for them on the spot. Most of the time, it's just, thank you for listening. And that will solve probably you know, up to 70 or 80% of these difficulties is talk about the truth, tell them why, and listen. And that is a, a majority of the issues have to come down to, I just would like to talk to someone about this. And they're not looking for an immediate answer, just someone to listen. We don't have to have all the answers. And so just be aware of that one as well. Another, another strategy dealing with difficult people is to think of yourself as a servant, as a servant leader. Uh, one of my favorite uh, leaders in Catholic school, uh, Mr. Ken Rasp, who's the president of Muskegon Catholic Central in Muskegon, Michigan, he describes leadership as servantship, servantship, certainly a new word. Uh, the, the combination of being a servant and also leadership servantship. And so it's an interesting thought process to think of yourself in service to the people you serve, in service to your school, in service to the parish, in service to the Catholic church, in service to your parents and others, right? And it, it changes everything. This, this concept of being a servant changes everything about leadership. It's not about me as a leader. It's not a self-centered leadership. It's a others-centered leadership. It's a servantship. Interesting word, servantship. So another strategy is to approach the difficulty or the, the difficult person as a servant. How can I serve you in this? How can I listen? How can I tell you the truth? How can I be of service? How can I share with you the situation, right? So to go in this, this difficult space, how to deal with difficult people is the question. How to be in that difficult space and get out of your own you know, self-centered thought process and be others-centered is a, is a very special kind of leadership. And the language of leadership changes when you're not defensive. The language of leadership changes when you approach it as a servant. So I love that word. Thank you, Ken, Ken Rasp, uh, for sharing that with me. It is the word servantship. And Ken's been a, a, a wonderful Catholic school leader for 30 plus years. And just recently in a coaching session I was having with him, I visit him monthly. Uh, this, this was some of his writings on leadership and the word uh, servantship has emerged. Another strategy in dealing with difficult people is certainly listening, telling them the truth, uh, telling them why, being a servant, but also responding, right? So uh, if they have an issue that, that you've listened to them about and they're still concerned about it, uh, you know, let them know that you will find out an answer or find a response or find the policy and the procedure and respond to them. Uh, I, I had a leader once uh, share with me that after a series of difficult emails about a uniform policy at school, she received a lot of uh, negative uh, responses. And she was asking me about responding. How should I respond? Her initial reaction was to do nothing because it was so negative and she was taking it so personally that she did not want to respond. 
And I said, I know this is difficult, but take yourself out of it. It's not a personal attack. It's really a response to uh, change in the uniform policy and just why are we doing this? And so the response that I walked her through was, again, tell them about the why of this, explain the why. You know, one of the issues was the boys wearing ties, you know, neckties to liturgy on Thursday, and it wasn't going very well. And so, uh, they, you know, they weren't tying the tie and the tie was sort of pulled aside and it, it was a difficult, you know, situation for teachers to uh, respond to and try to enforce. And so they were trying, they were debating whether they should uh, invite the boys to continue to wear the tie for liturgy. And eventually it came down to we're going to continue this policy because it's tradition, it's liturgy, and the way you dress for liturgy is very important. But she got a lot of negative feedback on that. And then I coached her through the process, what language to use to respond to them. Not defensive, but in a servant way, in a service way, in a, a, a positive way, and to take herself out of the response. It's not a personal attack. It's about others. And so that is a, a question about handling uh, difficult people. Another question we received today in the chat is, how do you build a leadership team? Uh, how do you build an effective leadership team? And that came up uh, today in the, in the chat and in other responses. And um, again, uh, the, the key word there is team. And some of our leaders over the years you know, feel very, uh, I've talked to them about f feeling very isolated in the ministry of Catholic education. And, and they sort of feel like I'm constantly putting out fires or I'm constantly trying to deal with negativity. And, and I'm, I'm now in the, in the period of burnout. And how do I build an effective team? And the key again is to, to build the team. And I would say this, that in order to survive the rigors of Catholic school leadership, you have to delegate and spread the duties out between your leadership, members of the leadership team. And that could be uh, three people or five people, or in some larger schools, that might be eight to 10 people. And I talked earlier about designing your leadership team around the seven circles of Catholic vitality. And that is a place to start. We like the seven circles as a framework for success. It's not only an assessment tool, but it's also uh, utilized for growth and improvement and planning. We have strategic visions being created around these seven circles. Everything from leadership to academics, to funding, to enrollment, to marketing, all of that is in there. And we have schools using those seven circles as their template for strategic visioning, goal setting, and strategies. And so what I would say is to build your team around three to four different people with different skill sets that you get along with, but also they're not afraid to bring up difficult issues. And so no one goes this alone. So that could be a, uh, a leadership team that is a vice principal, our directors, our grade level uh, chairs, our different people there, and you're meeting every two to three weeks. And the organizational framework for this team is the seven circles. And I have a lot of writings on this and, and workshop material on how to organize your leaders around the seven circles. What's that look like? What is that as a team? How you deal with issues, but certainly delegating some some strategies out to them and moving forward on that. And so those were two questions. How do we deal with difficult people? And then how do you build an effective leadership team? Okay, I wanna take one more question. Uh, and this question has to do with a very uh, timely issue right now in Catholic schools, and that is enrollment and marketing. And the question came up uh, during my visit this week, what should we be doing right now in April uh, in terms of our marketing and our enrollment efforts? And let me say a few things about that because so many resources right now 
uh, since January of Catholic Schools Week, because Catholic Schools Week, as you all know, is always the end of January and early February. And that is a time to really promote our schools. So really since the month of January, there's been a campaign, at least this is the way I think about it, a campaign to promote our Catholic schools. And the first thing to understand is that as a Catholic school, you have a story to tell. And we talk a lot about branding and marketing, and sometimes that sounds very uh, professional, and sometimes we get intimidated about, well, we don't have a, a formal marketing staff or expertise. And my contention is you don't need to be a marketing professional, but there's certainly strategies that must be executed. So uh, right now in April, uh, you should have a very comprehensive day-to-day -day, weekly marketing plan in place. And that marketing plan is your story that you're trying to tell. And that could be based on uh, your social media plan. Uh, maybe you have a direct mail plan. Maybe you have phone calls you're making. Maybe you're following up on parents that came to an open house, but certainly all of those are in place. Another wow factor that I talk about right now is to do a very, very good job on the campus tour. Uh, I was at a school, of course, this week, and they shared with me that they've been doing almost a tour every day for the last three months. You know, not, not seven tours a day, but individual family tours. Maybe there's a morning tour and an afternoon tour. If you get a family on campus, this is very special. And to understand the student on the tour and also the parents on the tour and to make the tour very, very special, to make the tour tailored, to make the tour personalized and to make sure it's the wow factor. And the tour is about the, the student and the parents and how we're going to serve them as parents and students at our school. And so I think certainly right now, there's a high priority on uh, telling the story through social media and through other marketing strategies, but certainly focusing on getting families in the building and doing an outstanding tour. If we know that the student is incoming to a particular grade level, maybe there's a, the student is in first grade now, but they're going to be elevating to second grade, then we want to tailor that tour to the second grade year, right? And, and get second grade teachers on the tour and second grade students on the tour and principals on the tour and certainly uh, customize the campus tour. I call the campus tour uh, the, the wow factor. And so we need to make the tour uh, the wow factor. So those things are going on right now. And, and we don't really stop those things until uh, the summer and even on through registration. And the final thing that I will say as we begin to wrap up here is that enrollment is everything and everything is enrollment right now, because if we don't have students in the building, we don't have a school. So let me repeat that. We say a lot in our work that enrollment is everything and everything is enrollment, because if we don't have students and parents to educate and to, to, to have in our building, the mission of our Catholic school ceases to exist. So I just want to remind us of that as we move forward uh, into the future. So as we wrap up here today, first of all, thank you for joining us. It's been a great one hour. It always goes by <laughs> really quickly. Uh, I want to share with you our next session. We'll be very specific on this topic on enrollment management, strategic enrollment management, Thursday, May 18th at 11 a.m. Uh, invite your team, invite your faculty members, invite parents as we continue this, this wonderful process. We're so excited that people are jumping on to, to, to this platform, uh, the Circle, uh, part of the Catholic Vitality Collective. Uh, it's a free service and uh, we love to have people join us. So please think about that as we get closer to May 18th and uh, certainly finishing the school year uh, very strong. I also wanna remind you that we're certainly open to uh, visiting with you if you have needs that we can address. Uh, maybe it's a Zoom call, maybe it's a phone call, and also an on-site visit. The reference this week to the school that I visited on Tuesday came about through an invitation just like that. 
I was doing a workshop with them and they were in a group of schools over this uh, Vitality workshop series. And I simply mentioned to them that I'm willing to come to your school and make a visit. And they took me up on it. And I spent a full day with them on Tuesday, meeting with the teachers, doing an in-service, talking to their advancement office, going through their strategic vision. They completed the assessment scorecard. And so we looked at that and uh, we gave them some, some advice on how to move forward. And we have some future visits on the calendar uh, to share with them. And, and it was a wonderful visit in keeping with that idea of partnership. So I want to offer that to you all as well. So call us or come to our website. We're here to serve you. And we're very happy to do that as, as we believe that this is a ministry for us and we're here to serve. And finally, I always share uh, the go forth message as we continue to live this ministry of Catholic education uh, that do not forget these, that to bring Jesus Christ to the center of your life, to build good daily habits through growth processes, to surround yourself with good people, to do what you say and build trust, to implement a bold vision and a culture of vitality. And let's not forget about the three Ps, which are prayer, patience, and persistence. So once again, as we close, thank you all very much. You can email us, always willing to hear feedback. If you have topics you'd like to share with us, please share that with us. And we're certainly willing to listen. So let's close out this very successful session. Thank you for being here. We'll close this out with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us recall that we are in the presence of God. Dear Lord, we thank you for those gathered here, for their commitment to their faith, for their commitment to Catholic schools, for their commitment to the Catholic Church. We ask you to bless them. We ask the Holy Spirit to give them wisdom and guidance in their ministry. We ask them to understand that reaching out is a gift and reaching out is a skill and that we're not alone in this work. We ask your blessings on the continued season of Easter, that during our Lenten sacrifice, we may continue those gifts and all those blessings as we continue our Catholic faith. For all those gathered here, thank you very much. We pray, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Once again, thank you all so very much. Join us in May and, and look for us on social media. Call us and write us, and we're happy to help you. Once again, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.